Crossroads Media. What do you know? Joel Embiid touches the floor twice, and the Sixers are 2-0. and <laughs> I mean, Tyrese Maxey deserves just as much love as the big man, if not even more, for tonight's effort. But it's not weird, okay? It's not strange that the presence of the big fella changes everything. It changes my optimism. It changes the entire team's optimism. It changes the flow. It changes the offense. It changes the defense. It changes the energy. It changes the coach and his ability to put his fingerprints on things. It changes Kelly Oubre. It changes Kyle Lowry. It changes everyone. It changes me. It changes you. It changes the whole world, okay? Because Joel Embiid is special. And the fact that he's here and you're reminded of what can be when he's available puts a huge smile on my face. That was a massive win. That's as big of a regular season game as you can find in the NBA. Not a ton of them hold a lot of weight. But when you're fighting with a couple of games to go and you're looking at the play-in scenario and trying to squeeze up there with a couple more wins, and you know, you're going to have to do some damage here and you can't let anything slip and you have to keep going on the prowl. But you definitely opened up a possibility here and I'm excited to see how they handle it. It's big. And for Tyrese Maxey to go 37 points, 11 assists. He was one rebound shy of a triple-double. But those 11 assists only had one turnover involved. That is a special, special game. He jacked up 14 threes, so not afraid to let it fly. He hit some awesome mid-range jumpers. He closed the game out with free throws, and let's not act like that's not a big deal. All right, you're on the road. You're in a hostile environment. Close it out, and he drained them. His speed and ability to get to the rack was on display. Tyrese Maxey did it all, and he had some help from Kelly Oubre, and Jimmy Buckets missed, which was fucking awesome to see him fail. Terry Rozier knocked one of those threes down late, and my eyes started to bleed. I wondered what was going on with some of those runs. Now, in the second quarter, I think a lot of that came down to the Sixers just missing wide-open looks. I mean, you're generating good shot opportunities. You're finding good shot selection, and, you know, you just have to bury them, and at times they weren't. It was a little sloppy with the rebounding department. It was also sloppy at the end of quarters, late quarters. You're you're not snagging all the momentum, and you're allowing the other team to have some life. You need to keep the energy in your favor, so they definitely needed to clean that up. And then, of course, in that fourth, when there was a massive run for Miami, you just wondered, what the hell is going on here? And for you to clap back and go on a nice run towards the end, get some stops, get some fast break points, Kelly Oubre with the three in the corner and just the way he let it fly and he kept his hand out there admiring it it's almost like he knew and the half second the ball was in the air I knew damn it and it was splashed just straight up wet money when the time was needed not afraid not worried about the moment just let me cook and he was awesome he was electric and um you know it's totally different with Joel Embiid and it's just that simple was I afraid that the zone was going to kill them forever and be the full-on death of them Maybe. Maybe. I don't know what else to tell you other than maybe. That seemed to be something that we discussed since the Brett Brown era, though. So that's not a Nick Nurse thing, a Doc Rivers thing, a Brett Brown thing. I just think sometimes it gets you out of your funk. Gets you out of your comfort zone. You got to find a way. However you do it. I don't care how. Just do it. And eventually, this team did. But I can't overstate enough how impactful Tyrese Maxey was. He's had more scoring nights with more points than 37, but it was the overall command of the game. It was some of the late shots he made in the fourth quarter. How about the first quarter just to fire things off? I turn on NBC Sports Philadelphia. I see the score at the bottom right because I missed the first 50 seconds of the game. Shame on me. I'm a horrendous fan. 10-0, Tyrese Maxey scoring at will. He's just setting the tone nice and early. He was so good. He was so damn good. I I couldn't even process it. And right now, I'm almost still in a little bit of awe trying to relive some of those moments because that was a very up and down game. That was a constant battle with yourself, wondering, all right, do they have enough? All right, are we putting too much on the Joel Embiid's shoulders to have to fix all of this by just his presence being here? Hold on a second. Maybe they do have the answers. Hold on. That was a phenomenal run. Ah, man, but now they can't. 
can't buy shots, this and that. It was back and forth where I thought that they were screwed. I thought that they would win. I thought that they had no shot. I thought maybe they could squeeze it out all within a matter of 15 to 17 minutes. And it's been a while since I had that type of journey throughout a game that mattered to me. Because as I alluded to many times, it's been one of the most uncomfortable Sixer seasons for me in quite some time. But Joel Embiid being back has put me full throttle back into it. But it's almost like a smack in the face, a reality moment, if you will, of, oh yeah, this is what it's like again when the big man is back and when the games are important and when there's something on the line. So I don't know what this means for this team, but I do know that it's fun again. I do know that Embiid's presence is so damn lethal and it's so damn important and it's so damn entertaining you see guys afraid of driving the paint. I used to watch guys look at Mo Mamba and their mouth would start salivating and they'd be drooling because they know they can go eat in the paint. They'd see Paul Reed. Nobody's afraid of Paul Reed like they are Joel Embiid. You just run through the paint dribbling the ball and hoping that somebody's wide open by the perimeter because they don't want the ball anymore and they know that they can't attack downhill. Of course you can't attack downhill. Look at what this dude's going to do to you. He's going to Swat it 17 feet into the stands, all right? It might go up to the 200 section. So stop it. Stop it. Don't even try and get cute. Don't even try and get fancy. And especially don't even try and challenge and go up and rise because you'd be an absolute idiot. And Joel Embiid standing there, it's so funny because guys don't know how to run their offense anymore. If they have the ability to see an open C right in the paint, that's normally 101 drive and attack. But you can't. You just can't do it. Joel Embiid's a monster. And Joel Embiid is still working through some things, getting back in shape. And quite frankly, I don't know if five, six, seven games is going to be enough for him to get to where we need him to be. But it's all just sort of a learning experience for us all. And it's game by game. It's case by case. The knee itself, though, if we're looking at the extreme positive here, the knee itself, I think, allows for him to play basketball at a high enough level. It strictly is conditioning, which is the best case scenario. Well, the best case scenario would be he walks back on the floor and he's in 100% best conditioning of his life. How would that happen? It wouldn't. So that's in a very impossible best case scenario, but technically that would be the best case scenario. After that, the best case scenario would be his knee looks good. He's got the brace on. He's able to do his work. He feels comfortable out there and he doesn't feel like it's hindering him at all. And the only thing you got to work on is just really the conditioning factor, you know, because there is a world where the knee brace is limiting him. He looks at a sink. He looks awful. He just doesn't look right. And he needs to get back in shape. Well, what do you do then? You know, right now he's doing enough where uh, you're beating up teams. You're beating up teams and winning and you're beating OKC. And by the way, real quickly on the maxi front, he didn't play Tuesday against the Thunder. So it's not as if my man took the floor the last time this team competed because he wasn't right. So this is him sort of being, hey, I don't know, status is up in the air. He wasn't there for you last game. He had to sit on the bench and rest. And speaking of guys who wasn't there for you, I'm not going to be the one to say it, but it wasn't a, like it was a Tobias Harris show out there. I caught Tobias Harris on the bench giving a couple claps for one of Tyrese Maxey's buckets, one of his 37 points. I just want to make sure that I clearly state that. One of his 37 excellent points, one of his 37 points of dominance, one of his 37 points of excellence, one of his 37 points of gross basketball that is going to be on the biggest stage coming up here in the spring, and he's going to put his name on the map. All right, we talk about him like, no other and yeah made an all-star game so he starts to get that national attention you wait you wait when he does this and there's more eyeballs and there's more attention from other outlets and and, and it's starting to be like whoa who's this cat you know what I'm saying like people know the name but it's different when you put it on full display for everybody at this rate 
I mean, I'm talking 37, 11, and 9. 14 threes taken. One turnover. He didn't turn the ball over. Think about how much the rock was in his hands. Think about how much he had the ball in his hands. Looking at the, I mean, look, he took a lot of shots. 14 threes is no joke. He made five of them. So he did take a lot of shots. So maybe that was a reason why he wasn't turning the ball over as much is because he said, dude, this is my time, all right? Let me get into my bag and I'm going to do it. So, you know, when you're doing that and when you're scoring, you're not passing the ball as much. But uh, uh, come on. Uh, <laughs> one turnover and 11 to set. He's bad. So here I am saying he's shooting so much that he's not turning it up. But he finishes with 11 assists. So that doesn't even make sense. Shut the fuck up, you idiot. That's how I feel right now. And I'm just so happy and proud that this team was scrappy and this team made impactful plays when needed. Creating a turnover at the top of the perimeter to allow Kelly Oubre to get in on the fast break. And when he put a dunk down too, he had himself a mean flex. <laughs> Kelly Oubre with a mean flex. And I know that I've said some things about Kelly Oubre in the very recent past here, and I stand by that. He is very up and down, and he is very inconsistent for my liking. But there's no doubt about it that when he is on a 1,000 and when his game is on that particular night, the energy goes through the roof. Oh, it's an impactful, absolute impactful sort of scoring that he brings. And it's because of his attitude and his edge that he plays with. It's not just his ability to stretch the floor and hit wide open threes, but if he drives the lane, he's always targeting the lane, whether for the good, bad, or ugly. He's always willing to go downhill and try and go to the rack. And there is some toughness about that. There's an energy factor. If you are able to, to dunk it over a guy or dunk it when there's traffic, there's two guys near you, you flex a little bit. Now the team has this life. that has the momentum. It feels that swag. So he does bring it. When he cooks, you can feel it throughout the rest of the lineup and even some of the bench guys as well. But do I have to note that Tobias Harris wasn't there and this team sometimes just goes through those really uncomfortable stretches because of him? Yeah, I mean, you have to note that, right? One of the big ways to describe Nick Castellanos for the Phillies is he seems like dead weight sometimes and there's a black hole in the lineup. Someone on the Anytime Hotline used that phrase about two days ago. He feels like a black hole. Well, Tobias's energy is exactly that. Sometimes you just shake your head and go, what do you want me to do? What can I say? I've already said it. For the last X amount of years, my mouth has moved too much explaining the Tobias Harris experience. I don't want to do it anymore, and I don't have any more opinions on it. It is what it is. Remember when he's jacking up shots? Brick, air ball, late in the fourth quarter. What, what are we doing? What are we doing? OKC, two nights ago, this man thinks that he's Mr. Clutch. This man thinks that he's it. This man thinks he's him. This man thinks it's his time. It's not your time. I hate to break it to you, dude. It's not your time. All right? It's just a, a, officially. All right? I'm going to be the one to say it. Yo, Tobias, it's officially not your time. <laughs> I mean, I'm just being honest with you. I'm going to go through the play-by-play -play of the 109-105 win against OKC Tuesday night and... I just, I, I can't believe it. I mean, I can't believe it. Tobias Harris misses 17-foot pull-up jump shot with 8.18 to go. Seven seconds later, Tobias Harris misses 26-foot three-point jumper. One was an air ball. The other one was a straight-up brick. And this is when the Sixers were down 88-83. So it's a five-point game. Dude's trying to play hero. Gets the ball right into his pocket and doesn't think twice and just lets it fly. Now, part of me respects that because he doesn't give a damn about what any of us think. He's just going to shoot it. The other side of me goes, yo, dope, what are we doing here? Uh -huh, we want to win? Do we want to win? Which one do we want to win? Or you want to flirt around a little bit with nonsense? You tell me. This is coming from someone that has defended Tobias Harris more in this town than probably 99% of the people. And I do believe that Tobias actually is going to have a moment where all the insane haters are going to have to show respect. I do believe that. I do believe that. You heard me correctly. I think there'll be a time where we actually go and, and say, hey, Tobias, I don't know if we would have won that game in the seven-game series without what he provided. I mean that. 
The game changes with Embiid on the floor. And I'm, I'm going to say it's less about Tobias and where he stands, and it's more just about the fact that the attention goes to Joel Embiid so it opens up the floor for anybody else to be available. And knowing that Tobias is going to play, maybe that's him. And I've absolutely noted his defense on Jason Tatum at times. Jason Tatum did not shoot the lights out in every single game last playoff run. Remember, he would be scoreless or be one of 15 heading into the fourth quarter. Then the fourth quarter happened, and then, yeah, we threw up in our mouths, and it was a horrible time. But I don't know how we got here. I ripped Tobias, and then that's what happens, right? Because I defend him more than most, and I know that there's going to be a time where he actually does something successful. Believe it or not, I do stand by that, and I think that is the case. And now here I am. That was a quick 180 in about seven seconds. That's normally how the Tobias-Harris conversation goes for me, though. All right, let's run to the Anytime Hotline. Let's take a couple of calls here. Let's start off with our guy, Ethan. What's up, Ethan? No? Oh, I have it muted. Oh, man. I have to change my soundboard. There you go. I unmuted it. Let's go to Ethan. Up, Rhodes. What a win for the Sixers. Oh, my God. You wouldn't even know Joel Embiid was gone for eight weeks. He's playing great. I love how he's added a little bit more finesse to his game, like the finger rolls and stuff like that, so he doesn't have to drive as hard to the rim. The only thing... I can complain about with Joel Embiid with this game. He was A+, plus considering he just came back from injury. He's got to give a little bit more on the rebounds. But A+, plus from Joel Embiid. He was awesome. Tyrese Maxey was a flat-out game-changer tonight, though. James Harden, but he moves off ball. Tyrese Maxey was in his bag tonight. And how about Kelly Oubre showing up in the clutch again? Shout-out Kelly Oubre for playing like a dog, like he always does. And he's out playing Batum, and Batum sitting on the bench. He sucks. Anyway, <laughs> great Sixers win. Biggest win of the season. Go Sixers. Thanks, Ethan. Appreciate the call. I don't know if Kelly Oubre always plays like a dog, but it does seem to be very noticeable when he explodes. That's for sure. He's very up and down. That's reality of it. But I heard on the broadcast over the last 16 games or so, the points that he's averaging, if you're going to get 20-plus points per game out of Kelly Oubre, I mean, as long as the efficiency is there, well, then, yeah, that's extremely important for you. He's not always a dog, but he's been a dog in the last few moments that we remember, and it's been a nice surge for this team over the last couple of days here and whatnot, and he's been at the forefront of that, so we do have to acknowledge it. But Toom is what he is, though, right? If anybody had the expectations that that guy is a force, well, then you were just way off to begin with. He's a very solid role player pro. He's a professional. He's a professional role player is what he is, but he doesn't have that much left in the tank. He's running out of gasoline, but he's a fine role player that I feel can hold his own and make plays happen in limited time. That's sort of what a Batum is. And he's at the back nine of his career on top of that. So just make sure that that's noted as well. Embiid's always had finesse, though, man. Embiid with the finger. Embiid does it all. There's nothing Embiid can't do. You want him to jack up a three, baby? He'll jack up a three. You want him to jab step you at the uh, the free throw line? He'll jab step you at the free throw line. You want him to throw a little hockey melange? He'll give you a little hockey melange. On. You want him to pass out of a double team and find someone wide open by the three-point line? He'll pass out of a double team and find somebody out by the three-point line. You want him to get fouled because there's someone who's on him who can't defend him, which is essentially everybody in the league, and then he flails his arms up because they have their hands in the cookie jar? Then he goes to the line and he knocks down two at the charity stripe. People only hate Joel Embiid and call him the free-throw merchant because he's actually good at his free-throws. Most big men have no touch. Most most big men don't have any idea on how to have feel at the line, and it's straight brick, brick, brick. Nobody cares when you foul Dwight Howard on purpose. Nobody cares when you send Ben Simmons to the line. No one cares about free throw merchants when they stink, but when they don't stink, it becomes the biggest talking point, and the only reason why they score is because of free throws, not remembering that the reason why he's going to the free throw line is because no one is as good as you, and when you start getting into all of your tricks, he 
confuse you. Last time he went baseline, he did this. Now he's got this. All right, well, he did this the last time he went baseline. And it's not like he went back to his first trick. He's got seven more he could dip into. I don't know what else to do. If you watch Caitlin Clark in Iowa play LSU the other night, which was a fantastic game, you had the blonde who was defending um, Caitlin Clark, and she was trending on Twitter all day long. And sometimes you just, what, 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 what? What? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't have the answers. Well, when you don't have the answers, more times than not, you're sending someone to the line when you have the skill set that Embiid does. Never understood that narrative. It's just uneducated people who are unaware that others go to the line. Dominant forces, just like him, go to the line. He just makes them. So now he's getting all of the blame for actually being good at his craft and having touch as a scorer. Oh, okay. Yeah, make that make sense. Let's take another call here. I is up, bro. How how are we doing tonight? And I'm gonna be perfectly honest with you. I I had to just keep following the game like something with my cable wouldn't work with NBC Sports Philadelphia. But my message is still the same. And my message is this team is so different with Embiid. And I honestly think Kelly Oubre looks so much better with Embiid. Dude, the separation he gets is insane. Like, I just honestly don't understand. I just, this team, man, like, this team is just special with him coming back, and especially with Tyrese Maxey. Um, but great win the last two games, and I am going to San Antonio to see the, um, the, um, fuck. <laughs> Sorry, the first game. I could not put my finger on what their team was, but nevertheless. Great win for the Sixers these past two games. Um, go, uh, go Philly. Wow, that's awesome. Making a trip out to San Antonio to watch them. I've never been to a road Sixers game. I'm trying to think of it. Did I? Did I go to D.C. once to watch? I might. I'm, I, I might have. I might have went to a Wizards game down at D.C. against the Sixers before. I think. I know I went to a Maryland game. And Mello Trimble was on the team. And he ended up hitting a buzzer beater against Michigan State. It wasn't fully a buzzer beater. It was about .2 seconds left on the clock. They had to add to it. But it was pretty special. But anyway, just looking at some of Kelly Oubre's numbers over the last few games. 25 points, 32 points, 17 points, 19 points, 22 points, 22 points, 18 points. You know? He's, he's something when he gets rolling. It's just sometimes I want to rip my hair out when I watch him play. But your point is correct, that Joel Embiid changes it all. And that doesn't surprise a lot of us, right? We're aware that when an MVP of an NBA team and the MVP of the league goes down, well, your team goes from a 10 to a 6. And that's no disrespect to Maxi or no disrespect to Kyle Lowry, who has more juice than I thought. When they acquired Kyle Lowry, I just didn't know what he'd be able to give you. But he's got a little more. I mean, I keep going back to the time he he played for Miami, excuse me, and he was hobbling on one leg. Looked like the guy pretty much was just running out of gas. And now here we are, and he's got some life for you. Same with campaign at times. Drills a big shot. So you just have the, the better bench that we've seen. And now Embiid's here, and you're paired up with Tyrese Maxey, who now has freedom to be it. You don't have to worry about James Harden, and now I'm seeing Paul George asked about him, and the, the Clippers are starting to wonder, how can we get him out of his funk? How can we get him feeling good again? Well, we don't have to worry about that drama anymore. Let Tyrese Maxey be able to see the floor and play the game. Let it come natural to him. And when you do, you see games like this, and he absolutely flourishes. So you have your deepest bench. You have your best head coach since Embiid's tenure here and Nick Nurse. And you also have... Tyrese Maxey, who is, uh, I mean, just extremely intriguing. Raw, raw, very young, which scares me. But his upside is elite, elite, elite. So what do you do with that? What do you do with that equation? Best bench, most intriguing, ball-heavy guard, and your best coach with a healthy Embiid. Let's see what happens, baby. That's what you do. You got it? Let's see what happens. This is why I know... Is going to go down, though. You say all you want prior to watching him beat again that the bar is set so low you have no expectation. Then you watch them win two games. 
Then you watch them win games that they haven't won over the last couple of months without Embiid. Or maybe they would have one win like this, but it comes at the end of losing five in a row and losing some ugly ones. You're getting blown out. You don't have enough firepower. You get ran out of the gym, and then you win one that you shouldn't really win. But when it's sort of around all the slop, it doesn't really move the needle for you. But now that you see it happen a couple of times, if they win out, let's say they win out the rest of the regular season, you don't think that we're going to be losing our damn minds. Quite frankly, I think we're losing our damn minds now. Go check out the reaction on social media. Go see how fans are talking about this one. And I'm one of them as well. I'm giddy as hell. I mean, it is what it is. It's hard not to be. But it's just reminding me of Embiid's dominance. Embiid's dominance. But I'm also not a Sixers hater to the point where I never think they can get out of the second round. See, there's the portion of the fans that think that Embiid's so soft, Embiid is so bad, Embiid has no heart, Embiid's a loser, he's not a winning player that, you know, they they never think that they can do well. But I'm not that. So I always think you have a real chance. And when you're cracking at the door at game sevens in the second round, you're not getting swept in second rounds. You're getting to game seven, you're a bounce away, you're a quarter away, you're four minutes away. So you're, you're right there. You're right there. Eventually, you have to think the ball bounces your way when you have such a premier guy like Embiid. So you're you're always in the mix. Is sort of it. With Embiid healthy, you're always in the mix, and you never know what can happen. Joel Embiid. That's the moral of the story. Joel, Hans, Embiid. All right, everybody, thank you all so much for kicking it with me tonight. Go Sixers. Fun win and fun to have this team important again. Fun to have this team talkable again and relevant again as we get ready for this backstretch and see how the chips fall because, of course, we'll figure out if it's a play-in, if it's not a play-in, who you line up against, what teams are beatable in the first round, what you prefer to see if you do end up playing certain teams and how it all lines up, how do you escape some opponents, maybe you just want to face them full speed head on. Uh, Look, there's plenty of debates to be had. We'll get into it, though, as it continues. Thank you guys all so much for kicking it with me. I'll see you on the next one.